You know what Mark Zuckerberg used to call Twitter way back in the day when both companies were private? He called it a clown car that drove into a gold mine, a company filled with schmucks that nobody knew what they were doing to barely keep it going. Julian Smith, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Elon Musk's tried to buy Twitter. Julian, what the fuck's yes. going on? <laughs> Uh, oh, man. So every, I think I, I'm on the other side of what everyone else, everyone's like, this is catastrophic, because I, of course, I'm reading Twitter about this. Uh, I think, you know, there's this weird, because Elon Musk is not the founder of Twitter, excuse me, of Tesla. He's not the founder of Tesla. But he did take Tesla to from where it is to where uh, it is today. And, and, and so there is this there is a stagnation. I'm, I'm a small Twitter shareholder. There's a stagnation inside of Twitter where it's like everyone has wanted an, an edit button is like the manifestation of this. Like no one, everyone wants an edit button, but they don't want to give an edit button. It's like a manifestation of a stagnation that occurs inside a company when a kind of sometimes when a founder doesn't run it properly. So I actually believe Twitter is one of the greatest, most amazing things on this, on this uh, earth. And I, uh, so I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I'm for it. I'm for it. I'm for who's, who's against it. I want dude, I want everybody to... is against it. Ah, dude, your Twitter sphere is completely wrong. Look, let's give for the people that don't know what's going on. I'm going to give you the breakdown. Elon Musk has offered to buy Twitter to take it private. This is from the New York Times article. Elon Musk offers to buy Twitter. Live updates. His takeover bid at $54.20 a share comes just weeks after he became the company's largest shareholder. Here's what you need to know. Um, Twitter's stock price suggests that the markets aren't convinced by Musk's bid. I don't think I agree with that. The New York Times is probably trying to spin it. So Elon Musk has launched a takeover bid for Twitter, offering to buy it for $54.20 a share just weeks after he became the social media company's largest shareholder. Mr. Musk said that this was his best and final offer, representing a 54% premium over the day before he began investing in the company in late January. Uh, in the filing, Mr. Musk said, I don't have confidence in management and that he couldn't make the changes he wanted in the public market. So at that point, I mean, that's a pretty damning uh, a comment from somebody who's kind of just just arrived in the house, hasn't even taken their shoes off, and he's sort of curled a big fat one out in the middle of the carpet in front of everybody. <laughs> I don't like what you're making for dinner. Let me take over. Yeah, precisely. We're have a proper dinner this way. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I didn't know because the he's actually posted the the tweet that's gone super viral. I bet that mm -hmm. this is the the most accessed SEC document uh, of all time. Of Death, all time, by mm -hmm. far. So he's just tweeted a saying, "I made an offer linking to an SEC filing." Which <laughs> presumably does that have to be made public? Is that the yeah. sort of right? Okay, so this was out there mm -hmm. in any case, and rather than him just letting somebody find this, he's decided to get out ahead of it. But it's got in it. It's got some exhibits, and I don't know how <laughs> common it is for this sort of stuff to be shown there. In it, he says, uh, this is him to Brett Taylor, chairman of the board. I invested in Twitter as I believe in its potential to be the platform of for free speech around the globe, and I believe free speech is a societal imperative for a functioning democracy. However, since making my investment, I now realize the company will neither thrive nor serve this societal imperative in its current form. Twitter needs to be transformed as a private company. As a result, I'm offering to buy 100% of Twitter for $54.20 per share in mm. cash, a 54% premium. Uh, my offer is my best and final, and if it is not accepted, I would need to reconsider my position as shareholder. Twitter has extraordinary potential. I will unlock it. So presumably, you might be able to explain this better, but presumably sure. what he's doing here is he's saying, um, all of the shareholders in Twitter, I'm going to offer you a 54% premium on what sure. I started, a 38% yep. premium yep. on the day before. Um, mm -hmm. However, if you don't do that, not only are you going to look like you've been cooked to your own shareholders, but mm -hmm. I'm going to withdraw my, I'm going to dump 10% of my stock back into the All market. All of my ownership. And then the, and then the stock will tank down again to wherever it was before the Elon Musk thing in the first place. And so it is, and by the way, you'll note that the 5420 number includes the, the, the number 420, which he also did whenever he said he was going to bring Tesla private at $420, like maybe a couple of years ago, back when it was worth much less than that. So he said, I've got a private buyer for Tesla at $420 a share. 
always this number 420, right? Why is that? And uh, uh, why the number 420? He's not memeing his way through. A... I mean, are, are you sure? Because. <laughs> Are you kidding? Are you trying to suggest that Elon Musk is using 420 like Blaze Up Day as I all that here's what I'm suggesting actually here's genuinely what I'm suggesting. I'm actually not sure that he's not doing that, but the reason that I think that this is so interesting is that is that um so much of of what you do as a founder, as a CEO, as all of these things really in the public sphere so much of what you do is about telling a story and people believing in you. And honestly, if I can be, if I can be super clear, I again being back to being early at, on every on everything. When I was, I, I bought Tesla stock really, really long time ago, and and since it's like the one thing I wish I had put like all of my money into, but didn't. But but what happens is you're looking at a company that effectively was insolvent and wasn't going to succeed unless he was able to get people to believe. And I'll tell you what he's really good at is getting people to believe in something. And then that allows kind of like that story to ride out and become domino. But and he's good at that, like over and over and over again. Surely if he's about to take this company private, his ability to make people believe from a value creation perspective now becomes irrelevant. People don't need to believe in Twitter as a platform. They already need it. The difference with him with Tesla is that he his ability to garner belief actually then pays out dividends in terms of the share price. Yeah, that's definitely true. It's a different story. The main thing that he's going to, I mean, let's assume this is even real, right? Versus like it being some giant colossal choke and he's going to be sued by the SEC again, which he was when he did the 420 thing in the first place, uh, it is then I, I think that there's a huge percentage of employees that are going to be like, I'm, I don't want to want to work for this company anymore. And so you could see how it like could completely tank the number of people that want to work at that company. But it's true that Twitter has a gigantic amount of uh, 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 the common square, uh, uh, co common, uh, what are, commons value that is in fact not properly unlocked. Like, and I don't know why it's like people, you know, you know what uh, Mark Zuckerberg used to call Twitter way back in the day when both companies were private. He called it a clown car that drove into a gold mine, a company filled with schmucks that nobody, like nobody knew what they were doing. You barely keep it uh, going. And it drove into the one of the most valuable opportunities in the universe. That's hilarious. So there's a, a bit at the bottom. I don't know what this is. It looks like maybe a WhatsApp message or something. So this is, again, this is in the SEC filing, right? SEC.gov slash archives, blah, 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 blah. Um, and this must be Musk. As I indicated this weekend, I believe that the company should be private to go through the changes that need to be made. So presumably he's teed this up at least over the weekend. Um, after the past several days of thinking this over, I've decided I want to acquire the company and take it private. I'm going to make you send you an offer letter tonight. It will be public in the morning. Are you available to chat? And then there's a voice script. He says, best and final, A, I am not playing the back and forth game. B, I have moved straight to the end. C, it's a high share price and your shareholders will love it. D, mm -hmm. If the deal doesn't work, given that I don't have confidence in management, nor do I believe that I can drive the necessary change in the public market, I would mm -hmm. need to reconsider my position as shareholder. This is not a threat. It's simply not a good investment without the changes that need to be made. And mm -hmm. those changes won't happen without taking the company private. Finally, yeah. my advisors and my team are available after you, got, after you get the letter to answer any questions. There will be more detail in our public filings. After you receive the letter and review the public filings, your mm -hmm. team can call my family office with any questions. Can you imagine for a second that you are whoever it is that's received this particular letter at Twitter mm -hmm. yeah. uh, last night? You know, it's a quiet easy wednesday in the middle of april and out of nowhere like whatsapp message from elon musk and a voice yeah. note and you go all right I wonder, I wonder, 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 hold on a second yeah i wonder what this is oh elon hold musk I, I i know it's date night baby i i gotta i gotta look at this yeah okay. yeah just wait there uh oh elon musk's offering 43 billion dollars mm -hmm. to take my company private I, like i said i own like not a lot of twitter shares like not, I don't know, 10K worth or some number, you know? And like, I just want to hold on to them just as a relic. I want to put them on my wall. You know, there's like a, I didn't, I never got a certificate. I don't think you get certificates anymore, but I want to put it. them on my wall. You're like, wow, 
I knew that I knew knew about this when. You know? Okay, so he said, uh, "What happens next in Musk's Twitter takeover offer?" This is from the New York Times. Uh, Elon Musk offered forty three billion dollars. Here is what will or or could happen next. The board reviews the offer. The board will work with its advisors at Goldman Sachs to review Mr. Musk's offer. They will have to consider, amongst other things, whether the deal fairly values the company and whether Mr. Musk has the financing to cobble together a deal. The board cannot simply decide it does not like Mr. Musk as a suitor, but they can come up with reasons why they don't like the bid. Like, for mm-hmm. example, his ability to fund it, said Stephen Davidoff Solomon, a professor at the School of Law, blah, blah, blah. The board yeah. announces its decision. The board will likely take up to a few days to review the offer. If it rejects the offer, it can go in one of several ways. It can put in a defense mechanism known as a poison pill. Yeah. That li- yeah. What's, what's that? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so the details of the poison pill is, uh, well, the concept of it is if you if you consume the poison pill, it will kill you. And so if I understand correctly... It is uh, there are there's a huge amount of these in Twitter's bylaws, maybe. And by the way, you know, I, I'm, I'm not super familiar with it, but there's a, in Twitter's bylaws. There's a, there's a ton of poison pill provisions that effectively said if A happens, if B happens, if C happens, I uh, this this uh, this, I guess, software or this this public good, so to speak, is protected. Yeah, and so it's, it's possible and I don't remember what the poison pill provisions are, but they exist in a number of, of different companies' um, bylaws. And at Twitter, my understanding is, is there's a huge amount of poison pill provisions. There's more more than in most tech companies it's because wild. they're trying to protect it. It's yeah. wild that that's what it's called, a poison pill. Mm-hmm. It says the poison pill limits the ability of Mr. Musk and every other shareholder to buy up Twitter shares in the open market. Once it does, it could still decide to sell itself, but without the pressure of Mr. Musk, blah, blah, blah. There are reasons Twitter may opt to not do the poison pill, which, again, I can't believe that that's even a term. Uh, may be wary of potential criticism that a poison pill is deflecting the concerns of a highly vocal member of its community. Likewise, Mr. Musk, who's reported stake, incentive, blah, blah, blah. The board potentially looks for a white knight. Twitter has been looking for a sale ever since it went public, says Howard Birkenbilt, who leads mm-hmm. the capital markets firm, at blah, blah. Uh, Mr. Musk's latest activity most likely heightened interest in Twitter's amenability to a deal. Some private equity firms may be put off by Twitter's limited cash flow, but a number of technology companies may take a look, given heightened interest in the social yeah. media giant's power and reach. Mm-hmm. Um, looks like... The stock price hasn't it's it's bumped about ten percent in the pre market and then pulled back a little mm. bit today. It's fifteen percent higher than when Musk first revealed it, but is still down from a seventy seven dollar high February twenty twenty one. Keep in mind, like like Snapchat went public sorry, that my timeline's a little weird, but let's say six years ago or something like that. And has I, I believe it's even like less users but is more profitable and is trading better. And, and, and by the way, like, and I, I, I hate Snapchat and I had, I hate Evan Spiegel and all the people that are associated with Snapchat just, just on principle. But, but it's somehow, despite the fact that it, it went public five years ago versus public uh, Twitter that went public much longer over a much longer time frame, like Twitter still cannot get its act together. I like, I don't know if, if you personally believe that this is, I have I have always thought of this company, and by the way, there's a lot of people on Twitter's board that are that probably align with this Elon Musk philosophy of the founder or someone with a great deal of, of value, a great deal of, of vision can take it over and make it better. Brett Stevens, who's the co CEO of Salesforce, I think that's his name. Uh, Drew Houston, who's the founder of Dropbox. I forget the founder of uh, DoorDash's name, but another dude who's on the board of Twitter, and so along with others, Jack Dorsey, the current CEO of Twitter. So that's like a bunch of people probably aligned in the direction of like, okay, but what's he going to do? And there's another uh, say, well, maybe this is good. We've been looking to do this. So who knows? I mean, the, the 21st century is weirder than we've ever than any of us could possibly imagine. I think we could agree on that. Twitter's board met on Wednesday, according to a person familiar with the situation who wasn't authorized to speak publicly hours after Elon Musk's offer to buy the company. Mr. Musk turned down a seat on the board over the weekend, leaving board members who had recently welcomed him into their ranks to weigh a proposal in which Mr. Musk said he has no confidence in their management of the company. But what I found out was that the reason he turned down a seat on the board is because he couldn't have put in a bid to take over the company 100%. If he got was it. on on the board, so mm. that was one of the reasons that you know Twitter a while ago. And then think about you know the other game that may have been played here, 
when Elon first purchased his 9% stake and then mm. Twitter goes, oh shit, Elon's probably got the wealth that he might try to take us over. Why don't we offer him a seat on the board? Because if we offer him a seat on the board, he can't take us over. So mm. they're playing the game because originally everyone was like, Elon's a, whatever, a silent partner. He's not contributing mm. in the way that everybody wanted him to, which really isn't, no one gives a shit about what he does financially with Twitter. Everyone's bothered yeah. about what he does operationally, culturally, uh, in terms of the branding and its policies mm. and stuff like that. And yeah. um, yeah, man, I, I I was talking to Dan from Drinking Bros about this literally a couple of minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's so wild and kind of cool that we have somebody on the planet who has the resources and the motivation to do the things that everybody else daydreams about doing. You know, That's everybody right. in tech yeah. has an idea about what they would do to fix Twitter, mm -hmm. which is the platform of tech in any case. Yeah, um, I mean, I definitely agree with that. Yeah, and we have it also like like founders are younger than ever with more power than ever, right? Like keep in mind that that ascent is more and more rapid than it ever has been, the acceleration. And so for me, the person who really exemplifies this or the pair that exemplify this the most is Patrick and John Collison who run and founded Stripe in, it must be 10 years ago or something. And it's since become a $100 billion company and it's still private. And then they're like, yeah, I, we're gonna try and solve carbon capture which is like another obviously really meaningful problem for the earth. And, and so you have these people that still have their um, still have a certain amount of, of optimism and still have a certain amount of, of like feeling like they can still contribute and they can still do something 30 years ago, 40 years ago. And before that, if it, it always, it may be different to you, but like, it felt like all the people who had this power were old and cynical and were just trying to do like, like hold on to their cash and and get it to become more valuable and nothing else. Well, how old is Elon Musk age? Like literally 50 40. years old, bro. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. Elon's Elon's not a young guy, you know, he's like slap bang in the middle of what you would expect from somebody of uh, that, that's doing this sort of stuff. The difference is that he has quite a young spirit with him. Yeah. You know, he's got that that's very it. sort of contrarian, heterodox mm -hmm. fuck you to the man, dog coin to the moon <laughs> thing. And I dude, I'm I'm in for this. So, you know, Moving beyond what's going on here, there's some stuff about Salesforce tried to purchase Twitter and the sale went through and some other bits. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody can go and read the uh, New York Times article if they want to go and find out yeah. a little bit more about this. But mm -hmm. um, I think, it, actually, first question, is this what's considered a hostile takeover? That's a great question. I think the answer is uh, yes. It, what a hostile takeover is, strictly, like, legally speaking, I'm not clear on, but the uh, the understanding is that it is a hostile takeover in the sense that it is being done without the permission of any anyone else that's that's involved and it's effectively like backing all the shareholders and and the board maybe into a corner interesting so i'm looking at some of the biggest replies uh some of the highest replies here um it's a man who's willing to spend $41 million for free speech is a good man that I can admire. Someone replying said, if you're paying billions, you're buying speech. It's not free. I don't know. I mean, what mm -hmm. is it? The thing that I don't get is people's aversion to Elon Musk. Overall. They have they have a very strong one. It's interesting because like people often make those comparisons with Jeff Bezos too. They're like, oh, like how rich is he really? And they show like an ant and then a skyscraper and they're like let's this is you and this is how rich he is and they show these crazy comparisons of wealth accumulation that are admittedly like out of proportion with the past because of because of tech and again that acceleration that was able to happen it happens faster than ever but then uh, there's this automatic assumption that all they're trying to do is accumulate like like money is no longer valuable to these people and so then you could think, well, what's the next thing? Oh, is it power? That seems simplistic to me. It really feels like they want to make the world, you know, maybe the languages, neutral languages, like in their image. And that could be some good and some bad. But I don't know, like space travel feels pretty good to me, you know, and electric cars feel pretty good to me. Like admittedly, one of the stories of Elon Musk is he, uh, he I think he made some money from his previous company zip something before PayPal or whatever, and immediately went out and bought a $1 million McLaren car and crashed it on his first ride out. 
So we're not talking about a normal person, but we're still talking about somebody that has more vision than the average Twitter shareholder. I would say more vision, but the thing that's interesting is all of the uh, like New World Order accusations that get thrown at Bill Gates. Bill Gates doesn't have as much wealth as Elon Musk, but for some reason, more people seem to be happy with Elon, at least from, I guess, like the center right side of the fence, certainly seem to be a little bit more happy with him because he's kind of cool and, and young and hip and does like meme coin stuff. But I, I just don't know. I just don't know what it, I, I don't know what people's problem with Elon is overall. Like, I don't think he's said anything particularly egregious you know it, it, i don't think he's got like a secret alt-right past i might be wrong right here. yeah I'm, I'm not sure that that's the, i don't think that's the case either but there there is this thing that happens and it, the general attitude in tech right and it's true everywhere mark andreessen elon musk like jeff bezos is more neutral and by the way people did feel this way about bill gates in the 90s during the antitrust uh lawsuits that were going on with the government but it's sort of receded since then and Bill Gates became this dude that is almost like uh, John Rockefeller Sr. John Rockefeller Sr., his post-oil monopoly thing that he did is he went out and he spent an, a gigantic amount of money uh, donating, donating it towards uh, mostly medical causes. And his, his father was a quack doctor. And so he was like, oh, okay, well, medicine needs to be evolved and all these other things, essentially what Bill Gates has done. And But these people are... These people are too young for that, and and they still have energy, and they're they're like I can run another company because when you run one company, I haven't run a company as this big as that, but I have run I've raised a lot of money and I've built companies that are meaningful size for startups. You're still like I I think I could do it again. I think I could I think I could make it better and easier this time. So I bet he still has a lot of that energy in him. There's a a bunch of replies from Gab. Are you familiar with Gab? Do you know what that is? I am familiar with the website Gab. Yeah, okay. So um, there's one set of replies. Counteroffer, sell your 9% Twitter stock, invest $2 billion in Gab, join Gab's board, and let's take them down. You have right. to consider that bringing free speech to Twitter isn't as simple as buying it. Apple and Google do not allow free speech. So if you stop the censorship, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. Dude, mm -hmm. this is the equivalent of the guys on Pornhub that comment, <laughs> that comment things saying, Oh, I, if she, if I got my hands on her, if only I was in that room. Yeah, dude, she wouldn't know what we got. And he, or, or the people that comment on, the, you know, glamour models Instagram pages saying, "Looking so hot, sweetie." You go, look, dude, you, Elon's not bothered about buying Gab. You know, mm. he, he's. But this is the thing: is like, is anything off the table at this point? But like my, that, my that's the part like, that really homeboys, scares the shit out of me. Homeboys playing in a. 50 million 50 billion dollar hostile takeover of the largest town square platform on the world in the world yeah for sure he you know gab as a free speech alternative might be fun or whatever but it just it just seems to me like a really poor move i think rumble did the same thing when mm -hmm. rogan got popped by uh spotify about is he going to take episodes down and doing apologies and things like that and rumble were like oh we'll offer you 100 million bucks to go from spotify to us and you think mm -hmm. i understand that when you're sat in a boardroom that it kind of sounds cool but when you're everybody else watching on twitter you sound like the guy on pornhub saying that you should come to you should come yeah. over to my casting couch as opposed yeah. to the, the one that you're on mm -hmm. right now yeah and because the plat those platforms like nothing's been going but going to become Spotify, like no matter how much it like that's been one. And so that's the same thing with Twitter. Actually, the common square, it's just Twitter. Maybe, maybe I don't want to, I don't know about forever, but keep in mind, like it is the one place where you can go say some shit. Well, maybe not everything anymore. I don't even know about that, but like where you basically go say some shit, no matter how stupid or offensive it may become. And it is public, which by default on Snapchat, because we talked about other social channels before, it is not. On Facebook, it is not. On uh, Medium, that's behind paywalls now, so you not even there. I, on Clubhouse, I don't know that even is relevant or. I mean, Instagram's, or even Instagram's got the equivalent amount of access, but you are you are right. I understand. I, I, yeah. I think that overall, dude, I'm so down for this. I'm down for everything. Just but. 
burn it all to the ground, right? And let's start <laughs> again. Let's go Mad Max, total scorched earth policy. It. But yeah. it'll be it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm going to be interested to see how this. And if nothing else, dude. It, it, the, the thing that I've taken away so far is it's cool to have somebody that has the resources and the motivation to actually yeah. go after this sort of stuff. It's mm-hmm. I, I enjoy the fact that we live in a world where someone at least can offer this out. You know, it's on Twitter whether or not they want to decide to take this thing. Are there concerns about centralizing control and ownership underneath one person who, you know, it, it, let's say that Elon Musk gets a, a brain tumor in four years' time and decides to mean say that, you know, make some ridiculous policies on Twitter and right. that, that yeah. completely destroy mm-hmm. the platform. You go, okay, yeah, maybe that's not good. But you also have centralized control currently at the moment with someone who's going through obvious dementia that's got the nuclear football under his arm. So, you know, right. this, yeah. the centralized mm-hmm. control argument, I'm not convinced really, really works. Mm. But I'm I'm glad it's happening. I'm glad mm-hmm. that he's there. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, if he memes his way to owning Twitter, then like 420. Like, you're, you're, you're right in as much as at least somebody... At least, at least some change, dr- drastic change is possible, right? Whereas, like before, it, you know, I mean, the thing is that, that we say in tech is like as soon as like a pro- professional CEO takes over, that company is like there's like nothing ever happening ever with that company ever, and so this is almost like a founder like move, and I'm excited to wake up to the news. Kind of, I'm more excited to wake up to that than like somebody punching somebody on a stage or whatever happened two weeks ago. Yeah, I, I I agree. Um, Paul Graham's got this quote I think that I learned from you that says, "Don't give up and don't get demoralized." That's yeah. his advice to starters. Do you think that there's anything else that's missing from that? So that's that's part. That's from a famous article called 13, 13 phrases about startups," and the two the two ones at the end are like, "Don't get demoralized," and if you happen to get demoralized, don't give up, even if you are demoralized. And the reason that he says that is because startups are like not rocket science. Like so long as you keep going and you try you're able to even raise a little bit of money to keep going, you'll be able to deviate your way to success. And so that's that's actually like that's why the clown car was able to drive into the gold mine from the conversation before, because they were able to get enough money to just kind of deviate while the thing was skyrocketing. And so the the number one thing that they say in startups and it's true for all companies is like get someone to love you. And if someone like I just did an we serve coaches for people in the context of uh, of my uh, that are just randomly listening to this. Uh, I run a company practice that serves that serves coaches, lets them help them run their business. And so I just onboarded a dude and he's like, my God, you just saved you just like solved so many of my problems and he was so excited but you you just want to have one person like that and if you can get one person like that there's probably two and if there's probably two then there's probably 10 if there's probably 10 there's probably 100 you have a company and so it's really about and i think he even says it in the same article instead of making 10 people or 100 people ambivalent get one person who's just like i can't get enough of this to to come out of the woodwork or find a person like them. What's the difference between a startup founder and a normal small business owner? Because I'm friends with a ton of small business owners. Most of my friends in the UK have yep. businesses of some kind. You're familiar with Johnny and Youssef from Propane. You know, they've mm-hmm. been running a company nearly as long as I have. I've been in nightlife since I was 18 years old. Everybody there was running their own company and hustling mm-hmm. on the side, doing social media, doing whatever it was. Um, and yet, there seems to be a step change between uh, – there's something fundamentally different about a startup founder, you know, someone that's raising capital. That's, is, it, is it simply the, the sector or the industry that they're in, or is there, is there mm-hmm. something else going on that's the difference between those? Yeah. So the main one is this. Like, there was a period, and actually maybe it's still true, where every, every company can refer to themselves as a startup. But strictly speaking, it's – May, probably there's capital in the bank and the capital in the bank allows an insane acceleration to occur. And so there's like, you know, when we talk, we're talking about nightclubs, we talk about anything. Uh, my, uh, my fiance runs a pottery studio. Okay. And so no matter how many people she gets to become, to try to become customers of her pottery studio, like there's only a certain square feet. So there's only a certain number of seats. And so then you'd have to start another place and that's going to be expensive too. So it's like, there's these costs. And so from the perspective of finance, it's about 
the marginal cost for the next person is almost zero. So it costs almost zero to bring the next user in. It's true for Twitter. It's true for Stripe. It's true for what's uh, Gab. It's true for all of them. And so the zero marginal cost for the next customer or user means that it can grow to infinity with all with relatively low costs, which means it is uh, it, there's a chance, a small chance that it can become insanely successful insanely quickly, so quickly that it makes your fucking head spin. And that's true for Twitter. And I've run companies like that where it's felt like the wheels are falling off and it's growing so fast. So that's the essential difference. Speed. Scalability. Speed and scalability, ideally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, it's it's just, in, I, I find it very, very interesting because, again, I wonder how many of the guys, I, I don't have that startup. I don't know whether it's that I'm not in the right circles. I've definitely started to be around them since I've been in Austin. Mm. But some of the people that I've met that run startups are total droogs like these people couldn't hold a candle to some of the operators that i've had that have either worked for me or worked with me and you think like the shrewdness that the boys have got that i am their executive Mm. function their ability to be able to see and uh, be agile and predict Mm. and uh, charm people all that stuff right yeah um and i really do wonder whether if if we were able to um switch roles for a little while and i could pick kind of a dream team of the people that i've worked with over the last 15 years Mm -hmm. and i could throw them into startups and i'm sure that there's you know there's tons and tons of people who are unbelievably shrewd operators when it comes to their small uh plumbing company gardening company that they run their dog grooming business their online coaching uh Mm -hmm. fitness coaching thing and you go okay here's a hundred million dollars of seed capital and a pretty good idea let's see what you do um so Mm -hmm. it it does seem to me a little bit like uh, kind of first mover advantage right place right time and then and then presumably as well a little bit of um people having an existing reputation of being a person that is a founder that gets more mm-hmm. opportunities because you're a founder or a startup yeah. or an investor or an angel or whatever. I agree with all of those things. The higher the margin of the customer, right? The more money, like the less cost you have per incremental customer, the more you can fuck up. Basically, straight up, that's basically the difference. So if you're running a business where you where you make a dollar and you have to pay 90 cents back for to for that dollar, you got a tiny amount of money to make, which means you have to execute incredibly well. The most ex- the most uh, important example of that is a restaurant. A restaurant is an incredibly difficult business to, to run. You make 5% margin, 10% margin, maybe if your place is full. It's a really hard, diff- hard business to run. And if it's run improperly, you just die. So what happens to startups is giant amounts of capital become accessible which performs, which gives you an opportunity to fuck up over and over and over again. You can become a good operator, but you just don't have the amount of uh, the amount of discipline that you need in real industries. Oh, because you've got more degrees of freedom to mess up. That's right. And so the primary reason that you need that ability to fuck up at the very beginning is because you actually don't know who you're serving. Typically, like an online, Yusuf is a good example, online coaching business, you know who the next trick or mental customer is. You know how to get the first one. You're like, okay, you know, the referral business, like maybe I'll get another uh, referral after that. Startups are filled with ambiguity. We're going to come up with this insane idea. It makes no sense, but randomly some dude is going to give you 500K to go for it. And so that brings me to the other element. Not only they're probably they probably have poor discipline. And if they had real world experience, they would have had better discipline in the first place, right? Uh, but also the other element is they having, typically the CEOs have really good uh, ability to, to storytell. And so they are able to go to any random dude and I had to learn this skill, right? I had raised zero before in my last business and I learned that my, that my book writing and my public speaking skills could be used to raise money. And I, I was able to raise $150 million in my last business in order to, to prove that out, really. And, and so then you've got this incredible ability to try and build something that you just don't get in the real world. Okay, so let's say we use the pottery uh, example. Um, if you've got a pottery studio where you're, you're coaching people to do that, because the scalability is so effortful, 
because mm -hmm. for you to go from one studio to two studios, yeah. you're going to need to find another place. You're going to check with building regulations. You're going to have to staff it and stock it and mm -hmm. do all of these yeah. things. Being a good storyteller to unlock more capital to you still has a bunch of headroom that you're bouncing off, or a bunch of ceiling that you're bouncing off, because it's still very effortful for you to, to scale the business, regardless mm -hmm. of how much capital you have. Yes. So this is one of the – okay, interesting. Because I, I, yeah. I have some people – you know, think yeah. about, again, going back to nightlife, my, my industry, some of the ways that our guys on the street – that are doing PRing. I'm sure you've walked down a busy nightlife yeah, street, like sure. Broadway in Nashville mm -hmm. or whatever, like, hi, mate, where are you going tonight? Do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, and yeah. they're trying to give you a wristband. Some of the narratives that they weave, they're very, very quickly able to work out what is it that this person wants from the night out that they're going on tonight? Mm -hmm. Are they on a birthday party with the girls and they want to go somewhere that's girly and cute? Are they out mm -hmm. with the lads and they really want to pull? Are they looking for a cheap night? Are they looking for a fancy night? They're very, yeah. very quickly able to work out what it is that they want and then weave a narrative that tells them exactly what they want to hear, offer them a mm -hmm. deal that closes, and then do the CTA like, okay, so you're going to go up there, you're going to turn right, you're going to blah, 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 show yeah. this to the guy in the front door. Um, mm -hmm. So again, like it, it's just interesting how different industries um, unlock or enable different types of skill sets, mm -hmm. and the only difference is that the guys that are working on the street are making a, a pound per entry, that's or, it, or whatever. Yeah. Whereas the startup founder CEO is raising, you know, perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars for every for sure. time that he sells that's his it. vision in the best way as well. And, and and that brings us to maybe like another important thing that I actually, you know, I, I was brought up in a pretty working class way. My father was an executive coach, but it wasn't like a super lucrative business as far as he was concerned. And my father was, and my mother was a secretary. And so I grew up in the public uh, regular school system. What I mean is, is public in Britain, I think means a good I grew up in a regular school system. And so I just didn't have the network around me of entrepreneurs and successful randos that a lot of these startup CEOs come from. And they come from these worlds where it is possible to look left and look right at like a dinner party that your parents are having. And you're like, oh, wow, there's this successful like CFO of a public company that my friend that my parents are friends with dude on the street literally doesn't know anybody like that and literally has no concept of an entrepreneur, which I basically didn't have till I was 25 either. Well, right. the, the other thing that you don't have, even if you're in that room, so a good example of this, when I was in New York, I went to a, a, a couple of dinners that I uh, was a new world, a bit of a new world for me. And mm -hmm. I was sat certainly around people that have tons and tons of capital that they're prepared to invest in things. I've got nothing for them to invest in. They're not going to give me, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't need half a million pounds to right. to, to yeah. expand my nightlife business because again mm -hmm. we're limited by the number of people in each city we're limited by the number of venues that we have and licenses there are real world constraints that stop us from doing things yeah. so there's a, a sort of a two-way street going on here not only do you maybe not have access to the people but even if you did have access to the people their money wouldn't be able to do anything for you that's either it. yeah that's yeah. dude this is it's a very interesting way to look at things it almost makes me think that everybody that some sort of entrepreneur or is in a good position to have access to people like that should have some sort of startup in their back pocket just mm, so that just that they can pull it out correctly yeah yeah, yeah man you know you're, you're sat at the right table and you go well yeah actually do you know what it is I've, I've had this thing and we've been taking over for a while and it's blah 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 we're about to go full time on it i'll yes. give you the whole pitch yeah I, we're about to go full time on it and actually we really believe that there's this unconquered market for random thing and uh it's we're actually just looking for uh, somebody and a few people who will be able to give us the initial seed capital. And then my team will come together and we believe we can get it to like a million users or we believe we can get it to half a million in ARR. You got to know the code, the yeah, way yeah, to yeah, talk yeah. to What's people. the lingo? But if, immediately if you have that, what happens with and, and by the way, this is true for Elon Musk to sort of bring this thing full circle is people like Elon Musk, but less busy than him and obviously less rich, but rich enough are are looking for. And this is like maybe a, an insight or a weird thing for some people, but they, they have places they're looking to put money and they don't know where to put it. They're literally sitting around with so much cash going like I did randomly. I'm not one of them. You're like, uh, I'll buy Twitter stock is like what some rando dude will say. But others have put all the money in the stock market that they want. And now they're, they still have it. And they're like, 
I got to give it to people and make it grow somehow. Well, think and about that's where, right? Think about Angel List, right? What is Angel List? Like Angel List is basically a a platform for people who need money to access people who have money that want to give it away. Exactly right. And that's- then syndicates are some dude, literally like yourself or like myself, who's like, I know a bunch of rich people that are on my list. And then I've got these entrepreneurs and I met them once and we're going to give them 250K. That's, that's, I mean, that is what angel list syndicates are. And, it, and the amount of money that flows uh, through the ecosystem is, is sometimes like, that, and by the way, I've been in this, I've been a CEO, startup CEO for like 10 years at this point. But even today, it baffles me. Uh, we had a really good lead investor for our last, we raised $10 million from a, a, a fund called Andreessen Horowitz, which is a really good. Andrew, Chen, Andrew Chen's been on the show. Yeah. Okay. Andrew's been on your show. Great. Yeah. So, and so Andrew is my lead investor at Andreessen Horowitz. And the moment that Andreessen Horowitz became the lead investor, literally I would get on the phone just like this, like a, like kind of a Skype or, or a Google hangout. And people would be like, well, you're in the driver's seat. How much do you want? And there would be no other conversation needed because this capital is just kind of randomly sitting around. So actually, this brings me to the core thing about startups, which is that really what the startup world needs is more good ideas. It doesn't need more money. It needs people, little Elon Musk's. This is kind of, I mean, here we are talking about it. Little Elon Musk that are willing to do crazy things. And by the way, this is why Adam Newman of WeWork was so successful, is he just spoke to this crazy, unbelievable industry, real estate, that nobody knows how to fuck with, but that everyone hates. And he's just like, yeah, he's like, you know what? We have billion dollar companies. And he was like, you know what doesn't exist? A trillion dollar company. I'm going to make a trillion dollar company. And people would look back at him and they'd be like, I fucking believe him. I believe him. I and and here's the problem. Here's the, here's the problem that I have with it, man. Like, I understand that somebody like that can give a compelling narrative. You know, I had uh, a guy who wrote the downfall of WeWork on uh, about a year and a half ago, and that story about Adam Newman is is crazy and compelling. And I understand that he was a great speaker. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel very, very sad. There are, there are people out there who have that amount of capital, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, or if you're SoftBank's case, like hundreds of millions of dollars to be able to throw around. Yep. And they're so stupid that they're prepared to do it based on some guy's charm. I understand. I mean, you're, you've, you've literally, you've brought it to essentially what it is. And it, it, the reason that that's the case is because out there in the world, a lot of these people, most of these people have seen some crazy thing happen that they were not ready to believe with the, maybe the most relevant example is one of them being Bitcoin. Like everyone is just like, it's called what? Oh, it's called Bitcoin. You're like, okay. And it became what? Oh, it's like one of the leading currencies in the 21st century is, and, and, and so you've got these, these stories, these unbelievable stories that are out there. And when people miss these investment opportunities they then go well i gotta fucking throw my money at the next one yeah Fuck it. this seems to be kind of like a um this inherent ability this sort of artistic ability to clairvoyantly see talent in someone right you hear these stories about you know i, I heard the founder and i just knew that he was going to make it work and you mm-hmm. go well this is, and that's the bit that gets me. I think surely the business fundamentals are more important. Surely the uh, potential size of the market. Surely the overheads versus the gross GP that you can make on each transaction. Surely mm-hmm. the liquidity. Pick anything, right? Yeah. Anything that isn't whether or not Homeboy manages to keep eye contact with you during this conversation. Like that, that to me should not be the main determinant. And we're, it just surprises me that people who have so much capital do not use any more rationality than the rest Mm -hmm. of us and you'll know jim o'shaughnessy from o'shaughnessy asset management Mm -hmm. very good friend met him in new york a couple of weeks ago and Mm -hmm. he said to me look me in the eyes and he's like chris it's idiots all the way up although that's exactly what i was going to say 
It's, it's literally doesn't matter how high you go, the people are still dumb and don't know what the next thing is and they don't know what's coming. It's crazy. <laughs> Man, it blows my mind. So we were talking before we got started about your um, perennial ability to be a first mover slash mm -hmm. almost so early that it yeah. can be a, both a, an advantage and a disadvantage. Can you kind of lay that out? Uh, I, the, um, well, I mean, the, the, the examples, there's a lot of examples, but like maybe the podcasting is now a gigantic thing. I've started one of the first podcasts in 2004. Right. Many, many years ago. And I remember thinking, oh, the world's going to get going to get transformed. Oh, my God, this is going to kill radio. The same things that people say literally 18 years later, which is wild to think about. And so I have a lot of examples like that in my life. And I've learned to I've learned to to push that that characteristic of mine into be like, wait, wait, wait. OK, but what's actually going to happen in 12 months, though, so that I'm not thinking that the future was so radically changed. I'm now conscious of probably one of the top qualities of humanity, which is it, it just wants things to not change that much. And it wants things to change like a tiny bit. So when we innovate, uh, we try to innovate 10% or 20% at my companies that I, that I built versus 50%, 100%. Uh, you, can, you can innovate 50 or 100% five, 10 years down the line, but you got you to gotta give people one a step. little bit. One step at a time. Yeah. It's well, I mean, huge. so I've got a friend, Sky, a uh, good buddy of mine out here in Austin, and he's trying mm -hmm. to completely revamp the way that the advertising model works by using Polkadot, right, on the blockchain. And right. what, what he's trying to do is he's got this complex plan, which I can't really explain or understand. But it's, I, I understand he's trying to capture all of the area under the supply demand curve for uh, potential advertisers rather than mm -hmm. it being at one particular price point even if you have a dynamic buy on an ad on the back end it only moves mm -hmm. a little bit right you can't capture the entire area underneath right. the curve um mm -hmm. and I, we've been talking about this and he's like dude i I, and I really, really appreciate his vision. And I have other friends that uh, got this, they're super excitable and they're so positive about things. And it's really inspiring mm -hmm. because I'm British. So like uh, ge <laughs> genetically, that's kind yeah. of contrary mm -hmm. to, to how I'm programmed. But mm -hmm. he, we had a chat uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was like, man, I, I think I might be kind of trying to make too much of a leap here. I'm trying to basically mm -hmm. reimagine the way that advertising's done and the technology mm -hmm. that I'm trying to do it on has only just been finished four months ago i'm like yeah yeah so that kind of speaks i guess in a similar way to what you were talking about that mm -hmm. people need to be led cultural change especially in the business world especially with unproven yeah. products especially with uh, state changes and complete sort of shifts in the way that things operate it has to be done one step at a time. People need to have proof of concept mm -hmm. which is strange because in other areas like give me some money Proof of concept right. doesn't necessarily need to be shown, but when That's it comes exactly to right. adoption, it does. Yes, yes. So the adoption needs to be, what do we do in the next three to six months? This is what the best entrepreneurs do. They're like, what can I do in the next three to six months? And then, but how can I sell and how can I raise money on the 10 year, the 20 year vision? Or thought, you know, some, some people are like, we're gonna build a hundred year company. Everything is a sales pitch, okay? We're going to build the first trillion dollar company. This may be an Adam new one. I don't remember. But those are like, those are the, this guy has a crazy vision. It's unbelievable, even though it's just words, right? But words have an incredible power more than I ever thought. I, when I wrote books, I was like, I was like, that's storytelling. Like, that's not a job. I would laugh at people. They'd be like, yeah, I'm a storyteller. But I was like, oh my God, it's actually one of the most powerful jobs in the right space that exists. So if you're able to tell a story, that has incredible value in the right places. But then if you execute the way that a restaurant does, right? Super iteratively. Okay, what do we, how do we do the next thing? Really quick. Everybody has a job. Every job is well managed. Everybody knows how to do it. Everybody, everything falls into place. Now you've got a really well-oiled machine. And that's the job of a startup CEO, actually, is to take that capital and then try to execute on de-risking that machine until it's incredibly well understood and you can put it in a spreadsheet. There's an extension on Google Chrome called Tweepy, I think it's called. And what it does is whenever you go into somebody's profile, it gives you the highlights of their most uh, liked tweets from mm -hmm. all time. 
Uh, and right. one of the highlights that I pulled up from yours is something very similar to something else I tweeted the other day. So easy to dunk, so hard to build. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, so, I mean, this is, this is for some reason, this is really a really popular or offensive tweet to some people, but basically it's like, it's so easy to, it, it's so easy to talk shit about other people's things. It's actually one of the reasons when you're so early to things, right? Uh, people are like, that's fucking dumb. And luckily for me, I have friends, it's a funny thing to say, but I have friends that are like, that's fucking dumb, Julian. And and that they, they've been that way for so long that are otherwise really respectful people, but they will do that again and again. I write a book. They're like, I'm not going to fucking read your book. So so it gives you this real good humility, but also it gives you this incredible perseverance that no matter when people say no to you, you're just like, I'm going to keep going. I believe. I believe. That internal belief is also like another element of making sure that the company works or that your vision comes true. You have to keep the internal belief while making sure you don't quite believe all of your own bullshit. I know that you have worked with Seth Godin in the past, and he had a thing that he said in his most recent book where he was talking about a lot of the time you need reassurance from the world, especially the first time around. And I really, mm -hmm. really loved this insight because there's this sort of belief that we're supposed to have an unwavering, self-powered uh, gusto that's just going to carry us through whatever the problems are that we're going yeah. to encounter but the reality of this is that if you don't know that you're going to do something having self-belief that you're going to be able to get through it with no evidence yet yeah is, is kind of the same as delusion and after a while i have a, a concept called imposter adaptation which is the reverse mm. it's when you continue to disprove your um, imposter syndrome in the real world, and yet it persists. So that's when it's yes. been too chronic. But on the first, mm. on the first side of it, let's say that you're new to the market, or you've just taken a change in jobs, or you've just pivoted to some other other sort of pursuit. Like, how do you know that you're going to do well? And with yeah. that in mind, it's a much mm -hmm. more. I really like the idea of look the first time around. Try and get people near you that are going to say, "Yeah, dude, I, I think that you can do this. This is doing well. Get some feedback from the market." Over time. What you can mm -hmm. do is become as pig-headed as someone like Elon Musk yeah. that believes that he can go out and buy one of the biggest, probably the single most important social media company on the planet in terms of how yep. the platform's used. Because you have, whatever, 30 years of consistent daily interactions with people where you mm -hmm. maybe weren't sure how you were going to get on and come out the other side. But in the first instance, you need a little bit of backup. I really like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and by the way, if you have that around you, like the younger you have it, the crazier you can become, because then it's like, like if your mother thinks you, you were a little prince when you were young, you know, which I, I definitely have a little bit of that, that, I, that happened to me. It's like, oh my God, I'm invulnerable. Then all of a sudden like you cut your hand. You're like, what, how is this possible? You know? And so you, you need to have some foundations. This is why executive coaches to tell you the truth for CEOs are so valuable it's because it's someone internally that's going to be like, I will give you the self-awareness that's needed. I will help keep you on track. One of the things that people often believe about Elon Musk and these others is that these people are invulnerable and they're solo, uh, you know, they're these just uh, solo climbers. So Individual spirit. Climb, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, they'll climb Mount Everest by themselves with no ecosystem to surround them. But when you pan the camera out, what you what you actually see is a gigantic like support system. It's just not visible when Elon is tweeting bullshit on the internet, but actually he's incredibly well surrounded. And so uh, you need a combination of this raw, unvarnished pain from the market that really gives you a sense as to what how reality is going. But at the same time, you like you need to be able to step away and do like self soothing or co soothing right? In order to keep the momentum alive. If you believe yourself too much, you might go on for a really long time about something that's fundamentally worthless. And actually, the more money you raise, and the more runway you have, so to speak, the more you might waste your time for like years. The deeper, right? a, the deeper that you're going to dig the hole. Yeah. Yeah. Famous example of Justin Kahn, uh, who shut down his second company, forget the name in the moment, a legal company, but because his first first company, first famous company was Twitch, and he sold it to Amazon for a billion dollars, 
people just threw a hundred million dollars at Justin, right? And he was like, yeah, I'm going to build a whole business. And there was like a hundred people and maybe even more. And then he was like, oh, actually, we, we, we never found anything that anyone liked. But he had spent $50 million on a crazy amount of money because I'm, people just let him do that. I'm just looking at the market valuation of Twitch now. Um, it's got the users. What do, how do, how is it, why is it so hard to work out? Oh, is Twitch, is Twitch private? It's private, and it was bought by Amazon. Yeah, it was bought by Amazon yeah. for $970 million on August the 25th, 2014. Yep. And it's currently got, in 2018, it had 62 million users, so it's probably got, it's going to have an absolutely insane number now. What's it say here? 2 million average concurrent viewers on Twitch Amazing. in 2020. So that was yeah. two years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh two nearly two billion monthly watch hours mm -hmm. uh how many how all watching you, video games yeah why can't you tell well, me not all watching video games, but mostly i don't know how it's many use oh there it is um 15 billion dollars current market valuation of twitch according to some estimates and that was 2020 from uh, qz.com so yeah man i mean uh, it, this whole world i i find very interesting i had jason calacanis on the show maybe like yeah. two and a half three years ago and I really just, I really didn't get it then. And I kind of still don't really get it now. But I'm starting to see at least a little bit of the framework of how everything gets pieced together. Uh, mm -hmm. But look, dude, I appreciate you. I appreciate your time today. Where should people go if they want to find out more about what you're up to? Uh, I mean, Twitter is the, is the public square. So uh, twitter.com slash Julian. I was early to that too. And uh and then my company, a uh, software company that is uh, manages stuff for solopreneurs, especially coaches, practice.do. That's about it. You can look me up. I got, I'm all over the place. Dope. I appreciate you, man. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.